Uh, welcome to this session on intellectual property uh, in the information age. Uh, my name is Annabel Gonzalez. I am the Senior Director of the Global Practice on Trade and Competitiveness of the World Bank Group, and I will be your moderator for this session. Uh, businesses, entrepreneurs, and individuals have used uh, information, uh, knowledge, and ingenuity uh, for many years to create new products and new services. However, the information age is different from the past in many ways, uh, but at least in, uh, in three key ways. Uh, first, uh, the information age uh, has created a borderless world where companies and countries uh, can enter new markets and compete, but they can also collaborate. And collaboration is a very important feature uh, of this information age. And governments uh, have aimed at strengthening and uh, amending their intellectual property regimes and aligning them with uh, good uh, policies in the areas of uh, innovation, uh, investment, and competition policy. And they have also aimed at uh, promoting the private sector uh, having access uh, to a wealth of information that is being produced in the information uh, uh, age. Uh, second point that I'd like to highlight is that uh, one hallmark of the information age is the explosion in the, content, in the um, uh, production of digital content. Uh, Technologies such as um, uh, broadband networks, mobile phones, and the internet are just three examples of which have changed business models around the world. Time-tested revenue generation strategies that were used by large companies before uh, in the sectors such as uh, music or film or TV or publishing uh, are not uh, uh, are not lo no longer uh, rendering the results that they were uh, uh, producing before. Consumers are no longer just passive users of uh, digital content but they have become uh, active producers, uh, generators of this digital content. And of course, social media has become an ubiquitous platform to share digital content. Interestingly, uh, intellectual property sometimes has been characterized as an impediment in the information age because it is seen as creating proprietary obstacles to open innovation and shared collaboration. Yet, intellectual property may actually be a critical tool to help govern and facilitate open innovation and shared collaboration. Now, investment in innovation and intellectual property are extremely important drivers as well of diversification and upgrading in global value chains. So this actually opens important opportunities uh, for companies uh, worldwide, and in particular for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises uh, to connect to global value chains and to become global. So as the information age continues to evolve, countries are constantly seeking new ways to exploit their knowledge uh, and to position themselves globally. Today's session will try to shed more light on how intellectual property mechanisms and international constructs serve us in this interconnected world and how the protection of intellectual uh, assets can actually keep pace and yield new benefits. So we will be touching on a number of issues including technology transfer, intellectual property collaborative efforts, uh, how digital content can be uh, appropriated uh, in an era of open innovation, uh, what is the um, uh, uh, contribution of intellectual property to innovation, wealth creation, uh, participation in global value chains. So to help us uh, understand this issue further, uh, we have with us a, um, a list of distinguished uh, panelists today. Uh, we have Ms. Arancha gonzalez Laja, the Executive Director of the International Trade Center in Geneva, who, who is a champion of the internationalization of small and medium-sized enterprises and is promoting from the ITC a number of very interesting programs related to uh, creative industries, uh, ethical fashions, uh, and others. We also have Mr. Francis Gurry, 
who is the uh, Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, uh, who has been leading WIPO since 2008 and actually uh, was reelected last year and will be with the organization until 2020, and has the task of lead the organization through major challenges related to technological change, to globalization, and to increasing demand, uh, among others. We also have Mr. Shen Chang Yu, uh, Commissioner of the State Intellectual Property Office, SIPO, here in China. Uh, Mr. Chang Yu, Mr. Shen Chang Yu has been leading SIPO through a new phase of uh, strengthening legislation, improving property systems and intellectual property protection to encourage innovation so as to support economic development under the new normal. And last but not least, Mr. Liu Jiuren, uh, chairman and CEO of New Soft Corporation here in China, the largest China-based company providing IT solutions and services, and the largest outsourced firm uh, in China. So let me uh, kick off this uh, session by asking each one of you uh, to address the following core question, which is how should intellectual property systems adapt to an interconnected world? And uh, let me start with you, uh, Arancha, uh, to hear your views on this topic, please. Well, to me, the biggest characteristic of the interconnected world in which we live is uh, the fragmentation uh, of production, both of tangible and intangible production. Uh, and this is uh, in a constant quest uh, for value addition, uh, which is uh, the new norm uh, of what was before uh, probably uh, called industrialization. Now, in this uh, new norm, uh, of which uh, innovation, constant innovation, co-creation, uh, aggregation of innovation, for me the biggest uh, question is the questioning of the concept of both intellectual and property. Whose intellect? When uh, we are uh, faced with a co-creation with a constant innovation over our, an original idea, whose intellect is it that we are going to protect? Uh, the second uh, fundamental question uh, that I see is the notion of property. Which property are we going uh, to protect when uh, we are faced with a process uh, and not uh, an end point? So, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's more maybe that I have questions uh, about the names that we use, uh, and I don't know whether I'm saying something that is going to be anathema to uh, Francis, uh, but uh, behind uh, this choice of names lies a philosophy that in my view we have to dust off a little bit in the 21st century uh, we are in. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Arancha. Uh, uh, Francis, uh, your views. Uh, thank you, Annabelle. Well, look, I would say that um, intellectual property is actually an extremely flexible instrument. Uh, you know, what it does economically, basically, is uh, create of access, make access a saleable commodity. That's the basis of markets. That's how you get technology moving about. That's how you get digital content moving about, is you can sell access. Uh, so that's its fundamental economic role. And there are many, many ways of using it. I think the 20th century way of using it was exclusivity. We want it, we'll keep it. But we've seen lots of examples. So uh, let's take uh, one example of the Creative Commons, which is a new model, or open source. Uh, I think these demonstrate that, well, it's your property and you can use it exactly how you like. Or take Elon Musk, <coughs> giving to anyone free use of his patent portfolio in respect of electric cars, uh, which happened some er earlier this year. Uh, why did he do that? Well, nobody's quite sure, but one of the reasons he did it is to create the market. More people using the technology, the better. Uh, so it's a very flexible instrument, and I think we are seeing different uses of intellectual property in the information age. Um, there are, however, adaptations that the system is going to have to make. Perhaps the, the biggest, the putting it at its widest, at its largest point, uh, I think we have uh, the fact that, uh, as an historical legacy, 
we have intellectual property systems that are national. Uh, and we have economic behavior, which is global. And technology use, which is global. So how do you adapt basically national systems to facilitate, uh, as Premier Li Keqiang said this morning, global industrial production capacity, to facilitate the global value chains, to do all of this. And it requires us to appreciate the flexibility that is built into the institution of intellectual property, but to appreciate that people are using it in different ways in the information age, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. There is a diversity of models that are possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Shen, uh, your views. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, thank you. As we mentioned, uh, the intellectual property, property in the information age, I believe that um, the information certainly brings challenges as well as opportunities in this connected world and also has uh, revitalized the um, information age. I believe that uh, talking about challenges, I believe that uh, in terms of the intellectual property protection, as uh, mentioned uh, by uh, previous speakers, uh, indeed, uh, in this information age, there is no uh, border or no borderlines for the intellectual property. Team. And also, we have the virtual reality, and also we have talked about the online and offline intellectual property production. And this is indeed the challenge for us, especially we have the e-commerce development. In the connected world, we have the tangible and intangible products, and also the sales of such products have now exploded, and therefore, the intellectual property protection has become a very hot point. And this is indeed a very important uh, area. Therefore, we are now facing challenges in this regard. Therefore, in the information age, I believe that um, we are also faced with some of the opportunities and uh, a new um, energy in this regard. Actually, we are now having the uh, connected economy uh, developing rapidly, and China is also implementing its uh, Internet Plus strategy. I believe that, that um, hope that uh, we have the uh, Internet Plus production, Internet, uh, Internet, Internet Plus uh, innovation, Internet Plus e-commerce. So intellectual property plays a very important role because Internet is a knowledge intensive uh, area. Therefore, intellectual property plays a vital role in this regard. At the same time, it has also put new energy in this um, uh, information age. And uh, as we can see for the patent uh, application, for the top 10 applications, I believe that uh, for China, about uh, seven enterprises they are the IT uh, now from the IT sector so therefore this is a very active uh, sector at the same time it provides a very good um, platform for the intellectual property uh, protection and uh, for the application approval we are also based on the online um, application about 90 percent of ap application are now being approved online. So I believe that uh, from the information age, therefore, we are faced with challenges as well as uh, opportunities for the uh, IP production. Uh, Mr. Liu, your, your views on this. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the changing of this world, especially more and more uh, the technology uh, from uh, uh, the, the physics uh, to be more virtual, so they generate more uh, big uh, challenge to the governance uh, protection, uh, or even to uh, to uh, uh, to sharing those kind of IPs. And uh, because if you're talking about the sharing economy, a lot of people they try to like somebody sharing their IP without pay, free of charge. So the purpose they want to got a more market share. The purpose is not don't want to protect. They want to 
uh, got more benefit. But the sharing means their IP will be got more contribution from third party. If you look at many of today's business model is contributed by third party. They just uh, use a small trigger and then a lot of people country, uh, you know, contribute to this like their business got bigger. So in that uh, case, it's a little bit hard to say what is the value of the IP. The IP is from a founder, uh, inventor, or from uh, the others. Mm -hmm. So that make uh, the IP creation from uh, most before is uh, corporate or individual, uh, the persons, but now IP, uh, I can say a little bit of commodity. So every people, every day, they, they create a lot of IP, mm -hmm. but they have no concept to pro protect that. A lot of people use that. I take a picture, I use a WeChat to, to send. Mm -hmm. A lot of people use my, my picture to send somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's my IP, but now, now people make a you know, client yes. to use my IP. But this is a word. Uh, that word is a big challenge. Is what is the future's governance of IP? So how to think about uh, protection right. or sharing? How to use that IP to encourage the social development, technology development? I think those kind of approach, the cooperation or thinking about new governance in a new uh, internet age uh, is, uh, is a challenge to everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're talking here about the information age uh, posing uh, new opportunities uh, and, uh, and also new challenges uh, for, uh, for uh, intellectual property systems. Uh, let, me, uh, let me now uh, ask you, uh, Francis, a little bit more on this um, element of collaboration uh, in the information age. Um, and uh, basically here I think that as countries prioritize uh, intellectual property development, uh, the value of collaboration is becoming increasingly uh, evident. And uh, engagement in the IP landscape is making cross-border cooperation uh, easier. So um, can you share with us uh, what are some collaboration models uh, that we are seeing emerge in this uh, space? And in particular, in, um, in bilateral and international technology transfer initiatives, uh, what are some of the things that you are uh, seeing today? Mm -hmm. So let me start with the public sector. I think that we're seeing in, in amongst intellectual property officers around the world much greater collaboration to improve the quality of the information on which decisions can be based. And I thank in particular Commissioner Shen in this regard for his very constructive attitude and CIPO's uh, constant constructive attitude. That's extremely important. It's extremely important that we have decisions that are of high quality and that are consistent for enterprises. They don't want different decisions in every part of the world. But then moving to the private sector, well, I think in the, in the enterprise sector, there is uh, always a tension between, on the one hand, competition, and on the other hand, collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think that actually intellectual property is a currency. It's a form of currency that can enable collaboration and it can enable, or it does, enable competition. Uh, it works in both ways. Uh, and I think it's uh, very important to appreciate its flexible nature and to appreciate that people can develop it in whichever way they like. As a very, very, very broad generalization, I think that what we are seeing is uh, increasing tendency to move from strict exclusive ownership models to access collaboration. Now the most, uh, I think, prominent example of that is in, in the uh, digital content market. Uh, if you recall when, when digital content was first made available on the internet, there was a great resistance on the part of the, uh, of the owners of content. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there was very little legal content available in the very early days. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I think Apple and iTunes changed that somewhat, but they built their model on the basis of an analogy to physical products. You bought a soul. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know in the intellectual property field you don't actually own it, anything uh, ever, it's a license, but people bought songs and they had the same notion of building physical libraries. Now we see, I think, with streaming and subscription models, that what people want, people don't want to necessarily own anything, they want access. So they get access for a subscription to the, basically, the global repertoire of music. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and intellectual property, I think, facilitates all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the task before us is to build, I think, construct the global digital content marketplace. Uh, that's largely for the enterprise sector to construct, but we do need to make sure that the right balances are contained in that between, on the one hand, producers of content, on the other hand, consumers. Uh, on the one hand, the capacity to exploit the exclusivity. On the other hand, uh, you know, taking advantage of the greatest democratization of knowledge and culture that we have had since the invention here of movable type. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's an extraordinary opportunity, and I think intellectual property provides the currency and views flexibly. It can uh, create the appropriate, you can build on the basis of it the appropriate business models mm -hmm. to do exactly what you would like to do, whether industrial collaboration or cultural, cultural mm -hmm. and content collaboration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings me to a question, uh, uh, Mr. Liu, that I'd like to pose to you, which is, uh, is there still a strong tension between uh, lucrative digital content creation and the many open collaboration, open source platforms that proliferate today? Uh, and also, has the boom in uh, user-led content uh, development and online content uh, sharing change the model for the value ge for value generation and uh, content protection. Uh, Francis was alluding uh, to this. I'd li also like to hear your views on it. Yeah. I, I think that that is uh, that because of connectivity is because now uh, access to 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 uh, uh, digital media, the price got a lower low. Uh, produce uh, uh, the copy of uh, you know like uh, content or music. Uh, it's become more cheaper and cheaper. So because those kind of way, that like uh, the people, the owner of that IP or content, they like to approach different kind of models. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, in China, if you, you look at, uh, most of owner of uh, content, they like to sharing. The sharing with a tele telecom company, uh, I, I can give you an example. Uh, in a Chinese New Year, you can, you can write a small piece of joke. That joke is text message. The text message, one year, Chinese New Year, maybe can bypass of one million or 100 million time. And then the authors can charge a little bit for each of them, but a telecom company can make a lot of because it's a joke, every people, I got one, I pass to another 100 people, and then it's, it's just one night. They can make 100 million, that's RMB. So those kind of a new model is, is a create, a still cre creating new kind of business model. I think it's just the beginning. So uh, that is not only for the content, it's become an ecosystem. So uh, you know, the difference, uh, the party, they're working together to sharing about that. Open source mm -hmm. is one of a dedicated, uh, you know, that's a very success uh, cases. Mm -hmm. One, they promote the industry social development. Mm -hmm. Another one, I think all contributor also the benefit those kind of sharing. Mm -hmm. um, this leads me uh, also to another question which I would like to uh, ask you, uh, Commissioner Shen, which is uh, how to use uh, intellectual property uh, to add value to innovation, which was uh, precisely what Mr. Liu was referring to. And in particular, how do you think that intellectual property uh, can contribute uh, to uh, the development of the IT sector. Uh. Uh, these um, are great questions. IP protection is the original driving force for innovation. When we talk about science and technology innovation, there are usually two driving engines. One is driven by the government, like for some basic scientific studies, and those studies that are for the public benefits, and also for the aerospace study, like in China, when we send these uh, aircrafts to explore the space, these innovations are usually driven by the government. And on the other side, market is also another, the other driving engine. 
for innovation either driven by market or government. They cannot be separated from a sound intellectual property system. When we use these tools properly, we can promote innovation. So this might be one of the driving forces for innovation. When we protect intellectual uh, property, we are also protecting the innovation. This is also true in the information age. Especially the IT sector might be the most active sector in among all the industries, so we cannot live without intellectual property when we want to promote innovation in IT sector. And just now, we've also touched upon the point that IP will promote the value addition, the added value of the entire industry chain. We will empower the innovators with their ownership and also their use of rights and also the economic benefits when they transfer the IP to other parties. IP system in itself is an incentive to innovation by protecting the rights and interests of uh, the innovators. Also, it is a market mechanism. There are rules about the transfer of uh, IP, especially in the market environment, in a liberalized market. A sound IP system will be beneficial for whatever sectors in the entire economy. It is a driving force from the very beginning. It can also help the translation and also transfer an application of this uh, um, inventions. Uh, uh, very interesting uh, comments uh, we've heard in terms of some of the challenges that the information ages, uh, the information age poses to uh, uh, the governance of uh, intellectual property. We've heard of, of the opportunities, as Commissioner Shen was mentioning. Uh, uh, for you in the audience, uh, please begin to think about this. Uh, thanks, because I will come back to you uh, in a few minutes to ask you for your questions uh, to, uh, to our panelists. Um, um, before doing that, however, I'd like to come to you, uh, Arancha, and ask you, uh, from the perspective of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, what are the opportunities that you see that the information age uh, brings? First, uh, let's start with uh, the SMEs, which represent more than 90% of the economic tissue of any country. And this is true in the north, in the south, in the east, and in the west. And for SMEs, the digital economy, uh, the internet-based business practices, innovation is the bread and butter. It's not just an add-on, it's the essence uh, of where they are today, whether it is uh, to uh, source funding, whether it is to sell or to buy in marketplaces that are digital uh, more and more, uh, whether it is uh, to access consumers, whether it is to organize their businesses, whether it is to outsource, whether it's to innovate, and all of this is closely interlinked with intellectual property. Add to that that a big part of adding value, as we've just heard, and not just in the IT sector, but thinking in a sector where there are so many small and medium enterprises, such as agriculture, agro-process products, a big part of this has to do also with intellectual property, whether it's with branding, whether it's with protection of uh, geographical names, uh, and so on and so forth. I see two big challenges for uh, small and medium enterprises. One challenge is linked to the business model. We've just heard that the borders in uh, the activity are very porous. The borders in the intellectual property are very porous. So one uh, challenge is how uh, to uh, align the business models to the intellectual property or vice versa. Second, uh, it's the challenge related to the size and therefore the ability of the small and medium sector. First, to benefit from the protection that the intellectual property affords 
but also two, to make sure they don't infringe the intellectual property of somebody else. This is something we are seeing, for example, in the fashion industry, uh, with uh, amazing prints being created uh, by people who don't know that those prints, original creation, can be protected, but also with creators infringing somebody else's uh, designs. Mm -hmm. Now, I think part of the answer has to be uh, in uh, simplifying procedures for small and medium enterprises, in reducing uh, costs, in fast-tracking enforcement, and maybe, uh, and uh, uh, Francis alluded to this uh, in his opening remarks, uh, in uh, multi-jurisdiction protection, one that is streamlined with the activities of SMEs that certainly today are cross-border, especially uh, in the uh, IT sector. Mm. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, we've heard a lot of uh, very interesting things from our panelists, so let me now turn, uh, turn it over to you in the audience uh, to see whether you'd have uh, a question that you would like to pose to uh, any one of your panelists. And if I may ask you to please uh, say your name and identify yourself uh, when posing the question. Yes, please. A microphone is coming to you. Yes, I'm from China Daily. Uh, I want to ask a question to Mr. Uh, Shen. So in the 13th uh, fifth year plan, what will be presented in the uh, uh, plan? As we mentioned, the uh, 13th five year plan, this is something we are being formulating. And uh, we're still in the pro process of formula formula formulating. And uh, I can give you some tips. Uh, certainly, we believe that we will put more focus on the IP protection. As we talk about uh, IP, we certainly will uh, focus more on the uh, IP protection as well as the uh, services and also different areas. And the, to the whole focus is the uh, um, protection and applications like the um, auto. If we have the four wheels and now we have the uh, two driving wheels, therefore we focus on the uh, application and the protection, which are the two driving wheels. The other thing is that uh, in the uh, 13th five-year plan, we also emphasize on the um, uh, ownership per 10,000 people. So still, we need to further increase this uh, uh, figure. We also need to focus more on PCT international uh, IP application. Generally speaking, I believe that uh, we have uh, quite a large number of um, domestic patent application, and uh, we don't have too many PCT international uh, patent application. Many enterprises would like to go out and uh, compete internationally. Therefore, we need to put more focus on international IP protection, and also we need to put more focus on the uh, focus on the uh, ownership of IP of those uh, large-scale enterprises with the uh, sales more than um, 100 million RMB, and uh, we certainly will try to increase it uh, for the application of more than 0 0.7 um, application per uh, enterprise. So, but generally speaking, I think that um, the government, uh, the central government, will put more focus on the innovation-oriented um, uh, economy, and we hope that we can int integrate IP in the economic and social development. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here, and then we have two questions on this side. Thank you. My, my question is, I want to ask Mr. Liu, Liu Jiren. Yes, actually, I hear you mention a lot about WeChat platform and the text messages. It's very popular in China. So actually, myself is operated WeChat platform, and I write articles on that platform. Actually, 
Tencent have a very big and good copyright protection system for the original articles. And actually, for one year, there will be uh, maybe tens of millions of articles. But he had, they had an automatic tracking system that if you send an article first, the other one will copy you, they will identify that as a copycat. So my question is, is there any possibility for Alibaba, <coughs> Tencent, and Baidu to leverage their platform to help the intellectual property uh, protection? And is there any way for the public and private cooperation in that part? I think it's a brainstorm questions. Maybe mm, the, the chief, Mr. Shen, is also can answer that question too. Thank okay. you very much. That's a very okay, interesting okay, question. Okay. So, Commissioner Shen, you'd like yeah. to take a, a stab at it? So can you ask a question again? Yes, uh, indeed, uh, on the uh, WeChat um, platform, we actually have many articles published. So how can WeChat pl protect this uh, um, uh, art uh, article? If you are the original uh, publisher, then if somebody else copies your article, then it has the automatic tracking system. So I believe that the whole system is indeed very advanced. So I believe that for Tencent, for Alibaba, for Baidu, they have very very good uh, experience, and can we have leverage uh, such experience in order to have the IP protection? I believe that um, with the government only, we cannot have a very good IP protection. Can we have the cooperation in terms of the uh, public and private sectors in IP protection? <laughs> Indeed, this is a, a red hot question. I believe that uh, first and foremost, in the information age for the IP protection, I think that uh, we are facing a lot of uh, challenges, especially in the uh, internet age. I believe that uh, for the infringement on the IP, one of the features that um, it has a very rapid uh, speed of um, delivery, and also all the evidence of infringement would disappear in a second. And again, as we said just now, that uh, it has no borders, no boundaries, and also it has the online on offline um, infringements. Therefore, we need to uh, look at uh, very carefully, and how can we have the technology, uh, technology in order to protect the IP in the uh, information age? At the same time, we also believe that um, here we believe that in order to solve this issue, we need to focus on the three aspects. First one is that um, we need to look at uh, the Internet, in the internet, how can we have the balance of the uh, IP protection uh, uh, interest and uh, for the IP protection? I believe that uh, we encourage innovation with the IP protection. Uh, we also try to encourage the uh, transformation as well as the uh, uh, delivery of uh, technology. Therefore, we need to have three balances. First is the owners, uh, the, the owners and also the uh, service provider, and also the general public. We need to have the balance between these three stakeholders. Therefore, we need to look very carefully on the balance of three uh, of the interests of three uh, stakeholders. The second uh, balance that uh, in the uh, internet age, we need to enhance international cooperation because there are no borders, no boundaries in the uh, internet. Therefore, for the infringement of the IP, it is uh, very rapid in terms of its uh, um, uh, uh, scaling up. Therefore, we are protecting IP on a large platform. So in here, I believe that the third point is that uh, how can we develop the new uh, techniques 
for the IP protection, including some of the techniques and technologies, including those uh, which have been mentioned by you just now in your question. And also, aside from that, we also need to focus on the administrative protection of the IP. Because, uh, as you mentioned, the infringement, because it happens just in a second and it can disappear in a second. And administrative uh, protection of IP is cost effective and also very uh, rapid. Therefore, we need to play a very, uh, to display the role of uh, administrative uh, protection of IP. I'm not pretty sure that uh, I have answered all your questions. Hopefully, I have. Mr. Nurse, and uh, we had uh, two questions here. Uh, please, can we have the microphone? Hello. Uh, my question is uh, directed at you, Ms. Gonzalez. Um, I'm from South Africa, and um, I promote fashion designers and uh, cr other creative people on the continent. Um, and, and part of our work uh, we found has been in educating young designers on firstly um, avoiding copying from the you know, global market, uh, European designers that they see, mm -hmm. but also to teach them to protect their own um, um, IP. The challenge, and I'm wanting to understand how I, I, uh, your organizations can help these young designers is uh, um, lack of knowledge, but also lack of resources in then enforcing or even you know registering their IP and then making sure that it is protected. Um, that there's a lack of knowledge and also lack of resources to fight the big, particularly the big um, retailers who can very easily um, take the, the the property of a young designers who are ignorant and and produce it at mass scale. And we've seen this happening very often. Um, and then my other question, maybe to the panel, and I'm sure this uh, you've addressed has been, I'm from also the medical profession, and in medicine there is the patency law where you, you get protection over 20 years if you, you know, uh, discover a drug, and then other smaller players are able to benefit from that. Uh, in IP, um, I mean, uh, in, in intellectual property protection, do we have something like that where uh, those who discover first um, allow others to come in and, and benefit from what has been discovered and, and therefore also help those that have discovered to further innovate and, and drive the innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rancha, if you want to take the first question and maybe Francis, you can take the second one. Okay. I mean, on the first question, obviously, it starts with the regulator. Uh, it starts with the regulator also having the capacity in uh, the country in question uh, to implement internationally agreed uh, legislations that would uh, protect this creation uh, and uh, helping uh, the producers or the actors in the country respect the rules uh, but also take advantage of the rules. It's something that uh, Francis in uh, uh, WIPO has been pushing very hard with a development agenda uh, that supports regulators and it's something that uh, we are doing together with uh, his organization in the International Trade Center to address the specific needs of capacity building of the small and medium enterprises. Again, for whom um, intellectual property can mean uh, a huge difference in the price they can get for their uh, creation, for their production, for their services. Thank you. Francis? Uh, okay, so for the uh, second one, well, it, you've probably touched on the most sensitive area of all for intellectual property because health and intellectual property. And so I mentioned at the outset that uh, you know, what intellectual property actually does is creative access, a saleable commodity. <clears throat> and that facilitates the market on the one hand. On the other hand, it raises a lot of questions about cost of access, possibility of access. And these are the questions that are raised in particular in the health area, access to medicines. Uh, and uh, it's extremely sensitive. There is no agreed international position. In fact, the international position in the TRIPS agreement is really um, uh, reserves a large amount of uh, discretion to the national legislator to determine its position in relation to these issues. Uh, but leaving that, um, 
and going to, I think, your other, uh, the other part of your question, which is uh, that really related to disclosure. One of the functions also of the intellectual property system is to get technology disclosed so that it is not kept secret. You know, I could give you the example of, of um, the saxophone. You know, the saxophone as an instrument, as a musical instrument, was patented in 1842 by Adolf Sachs. Uh, and across the next 20 or 30 years, there are about 17 other patents on different sorts of mouthpiece, different sizes of saxophone, and so forth. Uh, all of that's in the public domain. All of it, anyone can make a saxophone. All of that information is there. Anyone can build upon that, and the same in the medical field. Uh, you can compare that with the violin, where the transmission of knowledge was family-based secrecy. The very best violins were made in Cremona in Italy in the 18th century, and nobody knows how. There's still lots of experiments going on to try to discover whether it was the resin, the wood, uh, what, what it was. So disclosure is very important because it adds to the library of human knowledge and creates the possibilities for others to work on that basis. And the exclusive right is limited in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take another question here. My name is Lena. Um, my question is also related to hers with regards on the SME perspective. Uh, because for a lot of the SMEs that I have been uh, in touch with, I think one of their main concern is actually with regards to cost, right? Because if, if I am uh, in country in, in places like uh, Singapore, and then I have to file my IP, and when I go into the other region, uh, you know, actually I, I run the risk because for some other countries, that the intellectual property rights may not be as established. Mm. So the question on cost and also in terms of accessibility, because at the end of the day, they, they were telling us, you know, um, with regards to the cost and access, sometimes it goes into the pocket of the IP lawyers. And even for myself, that is uh, also partly trained in, in law, I, I also realized that the IP world is, in fact, very onerous very difficult. In, in, in fact, o only just word mark, right? Sometimes you can get into issue because there's those who know it, exploit it. Like Mr. Shen said, you should use it, but some people actually misuse it in the sense that lan yong. You know, so how, how can we actually help and provide a better environment for the SMEs as per se with regards to cost and also accessibility? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, quick comment, Arancha, uh, on this topic. I think this dimension of the small and medium enterprises is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, in the trade uh, negotiations, in the trade legislation field. Uh, and it's an area that uh, affects uh, intellectual property as it affects uh, rules uh, to facilitate trade, as it affects trade in services and the manner in which we are going to be regulating that. There is a drive, and I think it's, it comes from the realization that there is a big untapped growth potential in the SME uh, part of our economy, but that this requires the legislator to better understand the needs of the SMEs and better reflect those needs both in the laws as well as in the regulations that are put in place uh, to support SMEs. Cutting the cost, simplifying administrative procedures, fast-tracking enforcement procedures if a small and medium enterprise has to spend uh, millions of dollars litigating uh, in, multi in multiple um, let, uh, countries is not going to do that. And finally, a protection that is multi-country as opposed to country-based. In my view, these are some of the areas where I would see, I would like to see the legislators exploring and pushing the boundaries. Mm. Francis, a quick word no, on thanks, this. Thanks, uh, Annabel. I agree with Arancha. I just want to add one point, if I may. The main cost for intellectual property protection is not what you pay the state intellectual property office or WIPO for the PCT. It's lawyers mm. and patent attorneys. <laughs> That's the predominant cost that you're paying. Uh, and then the second main component of cost is translation. Because mm. you're going into multiple jurisdictions and you're translating I I into that. And then comes the uh, state administrative fees that are charged, and they're less than 1% of the cost of international patenting. So it's actually a very difficult policy question to deal with, because you, you, you can deal with the 1% relatively easily, but you can't deal with this other lot very easily. Uh, and you can deal with it, as Arantxa has said, through simplification. 
So make the lawyer less relevant, as it were. I was a lawyer once. Yeah. All right, so thank you very much. We're going to take a last question from the audience, uh, please. We have a, a microphone here, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm from Economic Journal, Economic Daily. I have a question for Mr. Shen. We are in the information era. It is also the era for big data. Will big data bring convenience or difficulty or complexity to intellectual property protection? How can we do a better job in the big data era? Well, I agree with you in saying that big data will exert major impact on intellectual property um, landscape. We talk about big data, cloud computing, and the Internet Plus, and also platform economy. All these four areas will have major impact on intellectual property landscape, especially big data from its um, creation, protection, governance, and serv service. All these areas will be influenced by the big data era. An example to be shared here. Intellectual property protection involves um, enormous data. Take patent, for example, in China, patent literature has exceeded 90 million, and now it is approaching 100 million, and we've uh, set up a literature exchange system with uh, many other countries. So among this enormous data, how can we find effective, useful, and valuable information? How can we do dig this uh, useful information, we have to resort to big data. Big data helps us to find the right data to do the follow-up analysis and use it. I've talked about patents. Patents have close relations with um, the overall economic landscape and also the legal sector for governments, for business, and also for universities and um, institutes, these data are of uh, great value. For example, governments can leverage big data to make more informed decisions. Businesses can leverage big data to analyze the patent market to make a future market plan. And this information will also help the enterprises to make R&D decisions. Universities and institutes can leverage the big data to enhance their research efficiency. Then the next question is, how can we find the useful information among the big data? Again, we have to resort to this uh, useful tool to do the digging and the analysis. This is similar true for the protection of intellectual property rights. We need to leverage big data as an effective tool to better protect intellectual property. It uh, helps us to save the cost, reduce the uh, cycle of uh, reviewing and approval. Uh, so little time. Uh, we are approaching the end of our session. So I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Liu, uh, what uh, final reflection you would like to leave with us uh, in, uh, in two minutes, and I'm going to give you two minutes, and the rest of you for your final reflections in one minute, because you have spoken a bit more. So, Mr. Liu. One, uh, uh, this is a very important topics, especially for today's channel. When we make a big transformation from manufacturing country oriented to be more knowledge based country economy, so we must be, you know, uh, understand, respect the IP and to know how to communicate with uh, the partner to sharing uh, the IP with uh, all the stakeholders. I think that is the only way we can be a global member 
uh, in the knowledge society or internet society. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing us back to the big picture uh, uh, around this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, Mr. Shen, your final word. Uh, well, and um, great point that I should uh, take home is what uh, Mr. Francis uh, Gurry has uh, talked about. If we look at the entire production chain of a product, intellectual property is important in each link along this chain. In the past, we had the misperception that towards the higher end of this chain, intellectual property right might be important. However, nowadays, intellectual property rights is equally important throughout this chain. Mr. Gori. Uh, well, uh, I would say, um, you know, the, the creating the right facilitating environment. So uh, the gradual adaptation of territorial systems to the reality of global economic behavior, where we get the right balance between competition and collaboration, uh, and where we have a supportive or enabling or facilitative environment for this collaboration that can take place and that can enrich the world. Thank you very much. Uh, Arantxa? For me, it would be think intellectual property, think of small and medium enterprises. Think of how you're going to support uh, them using this as a tool to be uh, greater participants in value addition. And in that, promote methods of shared value, uh, especially uh, when it is about collective creation and collective innovation. Um, thank you all very much for your insights. Um, it is clear to me uh, that the information age has, uh, has put uh, in front of us uh, a big quest, and that quest is a quest for, for balance. Uh, balance that needs to be achieved in a new context, uh, under, under new situations, uh, with new stakeholders performing different roles, uh, and uh, this is still a work in progress. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for sharing your thoughts uh, with us, and thank you all in the audience for participating. Thank you.